We've been looking at rotational motion, um, and that's a little bit different than uniform circular motion because uniform circular motion just investigates a thing moving at a constant speed in a circle, and all the force is directed towards the center, keeping the object moving in a circle. But when we're talking about rotational force or rotational motion, then you actually have something that's accelerated in a circle. So like if you imagine the tires of a truck as the truck starts to go down the road, okay, initially the tires are at rest, but um, as the truck increases speed, this tire gets faster and faster moving in a circle. And that actually takes a force, a force tangential or applied around the tire in order to get that to happen. Okay? And basically, that's what we call torque. Okay, torque is how well force causes a rotation. You guys did the lab yesterday um, where you measured the force applied to lift a mass that was on the end of a lever. Essentially, you had this fulcrum over here, you applied a force over here, and you lifted a weight that was right here. Okay, now this is a torque because you're not actually lifting this whole thing straight up, you're causing it to rotate around in a circle like that. So you're causing a rotation. And you guys were able to derive this formula. Um, torque equals force times distance, which is actually R. R is the radius for a lever arm. Okay, so it's called a radius because if this is your pivot point and you're applying a force out here, then this distance is the radius of a circle. If you kept applying that force, you would eventually carve out a circle, right? So F times R, torque equals force times lever arm. Okay? And this explains why when you put a door stopper on something, right? If this is the top down view of a door, you've got a hinge right here, um, and you've got this thing propped open. You don't prop it open by putting a block right here. You prop it open by putting a block right here because then this whole lever arm helps exert a torque and keeps the door open. Okay, So torque equals force times lever arm means if you apply a bigger force, you get a bigger torque. If you apply it over a greater distance, you get a bigger torque. Okay, So I don't know if any of you guys have ever had to change a tire, but if you've ever had to loosen the lug nuts um, or, or loosen anything really, okay, you try to get a longer lever on it. So if you've got a, uh, a nut that you're trying to loosen off of something, and you put a wrench on that, okay, then what you do is you apply a force not right here, right? You apply the force way out here because then you get the distance to multiply your force. You get a big torque out of this, okay? So a wrench, the longer the wrench is, the more force, the more torque, I guess, you can apply with the same amount of force. Okay? So it's better to push out here than it is to push here. Okay, that's torque equals force times lever arm. Now, you know, that leads us to this idea of net torque. Okay, you guys all remember elementary school where you had the teeter-totter. And somebody would sit over here and somebody would sit over here and you'd balance, okay, back and forth. And if somebody was too heavy, um, well, either you had to change the way the game was played or it didn't work at all, okay? Now, the question is, where does somebody sit? Um, if, if you've got people of unequal mass. So let's say this, this guy over here is a mass of 50 kilograms and this guy over here is a mass of 75 kilograms. Okay? What distance should they sit from the pivot point, the axis of rotation, so that they balance? This is a net torque problem. Just like we've had a net force problem, net force was mass times acceleration. Okay? Well, if we're trying to get something to balance, this, one, this force over here is down, this force over here is down. Okay? But we're not trying to get it to not accelerate, we're trying to get it to balance. So this force is causing rotation in the clockwise direction, and this torque, their force, is causing rotation in the counterclockwise direction. And we want those two to cancel. So we're not worried so much about force, we're worried about rotation, okay? And so we're worried about torque. So what we can say from this is we want the net torque to equal zero, okay? Well, these torques are in opposite directions, even though the forces are in the same direction, right? Torque's direction is given as clockwise or counterclockwise, and usually um, counterclockwise is positive. It doesn't have to be, but counterclockwise is generally the positive direction, and clockwise is generally the negative direction. Okay? But that, that doesn't really matter. Okay, so keeping that in mind, these two torques, even though they're caused by forces going in the same direction, 
cause rotations in opposite directions. So when we add them up, we don't add them up, we subtract them. Okay. So the the question is, you know, where what distance is this? Okay, r1 say compared to this distance r2, are they the same? And if they're not the same, which one's longer? Well, if we're going to get them to balance, what we can say is the net torque, okay, is zero. That way, it doesn't rotate down, it doesn't rotate up, which means we can say um, over here the torque this one causes, we'll call this one t2, and the torque this one causes t1 are equal but opposite. So we can say t2 minus t1 equals zero or T2 equals T1. Okay, so then if we take this and um, apply what we know, so we've got to go back and take a look at that. We had 50 and 75. I've got 50 kilograms over here. I've got 75 kilograms over here. And my fulcrums here, this was um, R2 and R1. Okay, and R2 equals R1, or T1 equals T2 is what we just said. Okay. So over here, the force is actually mass times acceleration, right? Fg. Okay. The force over here is also the force due to gravity, which is mg. Okay. So I've got 50 times 9.8 times r2 needs to equal 75 times 9.8 times r1. 9.8 is on both sides, so I'm going to cancel it. Okay. So I have 50 r2 equals 75 r1. And let's see, if I divide, I've got 50 divided by 75, R2 equals R1. Um, I'm going to reduce that fraction so I get 2 to 3 okay, equals, and I'm going to divide over the R2, R1 divided by R2. Okay, And so what we can see is that R1 is 2 thirds the length of R2. Okay, or, Did I do that right? 50, 75, 2 to 1. Okay, yeah, so since R1 is longer, sorry, since since the force over here on R1 is bigger, we need a shorter distance, okay? And so maybe I should leave it this way, 2 thirds R2 equals R1. Whatever R1 is, okay, it's only 2 thirds the length of R2. So this guy who's got a mass of 50 kilograms needs to sit further away. So instead of putting our pivot point in the middle, we're going to move it closer to the heavier guy, which you guys all know from playground physics, but now you have, you know, the torque that goes with it. Okay? Now, of course, nothing is ever that simple, right? So you guys had a lever where you applied the force right here. Okay? That caused a torque, but you applied the force perpendicular to the lever arm. That makes sense. You didn't you didn't pull this way and you didn't pull this way. You pulled this way. Okay. Well, what would have happened if you did pull at an angle? Okay. So you guys have this equation: torque equals force times lever arm. But really, you have to pay attention to that force. The force that causes that rotation is just the component of the force that's perpendicular to the lever arm. So if we take a look at uh, I don't know, go back to the wrench problem, okay? You've got a wrench. Yeah, I've drawn better wrenches in my life. Um, or a little nuts there anyway. Okay, if you've got a wrench that looks like this, okay, where do you apply the force? Okay, so that you, or, or if you apply a force at an angle, how does that affect the, the effective torque? Okay, your axis of rotation is right here in the middle. And let's say that this distance, your lever arm, is r equals 15 centimeters, okay? And you apply a force of 20 newtons, f equals 20 newtons, okay? And if you apply it at a right angle, okay, then all of your torque goes into causing this thing to rotate around. And so your torque equals 0.15, right, centimeters, times the force, 20. So you get 30, or 3, I guess, 3 newton meters, okay, which is the unit of torque. But if instead of applying the force that way, if you couldn't quite get your hand in that position and you applied a force like this, and say this angle right here was 30 degrees, okay, then all of your force doesn't go into causing a rotation. Some of it tries to slide the wrench into this thing. Okay, That's not going to be very helpful. So I'm going to draw Okay, this force that you're applying, but it's also got its components. It's got the component that is 
perpendicular to the lever arm. That's the one that causes rotation. And it's got the component that is parallel to the lever arm. And that's the one that this little bolt actually exerts a force against. It does nothing, OK? Not torque, OK? Only the one that's perpendicular to the lever arm causes torque. So what you have to do is you have to find the component of the force that is perpendicular. Now, if you don't like this triangle, you can draw it down here. Okay, they're both the same thing. This angle is 30 degrees, or this angle is 30 degrees. In either case, what you're interested in is this perpendicular one. Okay, and so you have this triangle. The hypotenuse is the applied force. That's 20 newtons. The perpendicular is opposite this angle. Okay, and so you've got you've got this opposite side is really um, I'm going to say the F perpendicular is equal to the 20 times the sine of 30 degrees. Um, and so that's actually equal to only 10 newtons. Okay? So only 10 newtons of force actually go into rotating this. Now they do act right where you're pushing, so your lever arm hasn't been shortened. But now your net torque equals 0.15 times 10 and that's only 1.5 newton meters. Okay, so by pulling at an angle, you've reduced the amount of torque because only some of the force actually tries to cause a rotation. Okay, so your book actually goes in through this a different way. It says, well, if this is your pivot point and you push this way instead of pushing this way, what you do is you effectively shorten your lever arm. And they say what you should do is you should extend this force out this way and then draw your lever arm in, okay, perpendicular to that force. Okay. I I don't get that. I don't I don't like that at all. Okay. And then what they say is so use the full fraction of your force and just use this shortened lever arm. Okay. Uh, up to you. You can decide how you want to do it. But um, I think it's easier to go about this in terms of force components as opposed to uh, lever arm components. Okay, but if this angle right here is theta, and you decide to go this way with it, okay, then your applied force is again you're getting, instead of instead of saying well our force is reduced, we're saying our lever arm is reduced. Well, your lever arm is r. This is the side opposite r. So this is r sine theta, and so the uh, the essential result is the same. But um, I think it's easier to talk about it in terms of force rather than in terms of lever arm. Okay. But it's your option. You can do it either way. If you're interested in learning more about this one, okay, it doesn't really make sense to me, but your book goes through it, and you can look on page 202 for that. Okay. Speaking of looking on pages, there is an assignment today. I want you to consider um, problems. Let's see. Um, 12, 13, 14 and 15 on page uh, 203, as well as okay, some net torque problems. Okay, and net torque is going to be more than one torque acting on it. And so this is page 205. On page 205, I want you to look at um, the practice problem um, 16, 17. 18 and 20. Okay, 16, 17, 18, 20. Okay, work through those. Let me know how you do. Um, we'll probably have a quiz over this stuff on Wednesday.